Okay, we're going to continue talking about questions. And somebody asked a question about the extra biblical books that are in the Bible. So I have a printout of the charts. Amanda didn't ask, I just handed her a chart to embarrass her. Uh, I have a printout of all those extra biblical books. And so if you want a copy of them, you're going to better sell you. That would be great. Thank you. So uh, I made 25 copies. So for now, one one per family-ish. Uh, and I'll make more if that's not enough. But there's all these books that are mentioned in the Bible that we don't have in the Bible. And sometimes that causes people concern. And they want to know, well, how come we don't have that book if it's mentioned in the Bible? And we talked a little bit about this when we were looking at the differences in uh, Bibles that contain the apocryphal writings or the deuterocanonical books and Bibles that don't contain those. The 1611 edition of the King James Version had the apocryphal books in it, books like Tobit, 1st and 2nd Maccabees and Judith and all of that, in a, a separate section that they labeled as the apocrypha. I wish, to some extent, that modern more modern English translations would do the same, just so that you could have them for reference. Uh, but they don't. The Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, the English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, all of these, they don't include it. I think because there is so much confusion about whether or not those things are actually biblical, and I totally understand the rationale that including them in a Bible, even if you put it back in a separate section and you put ten pages in front of it that say this is not part of the Bible, it doesn't matter, it's in the book, right? It's kind of like some people think you don't have a Bible if there's no maps in the back. It doesn't matter that they're clearly not biblical, it's, it's, this is the map, right? And, and so I understand why they're not there. I would encourage you, however, if you have extra reading time, to read those things at least once, just so you know what you're dealing with. Well, this is a list of books that are mentioned in the Bible that are not included in the Bible that you have. They're referenced in the Bible. There's the account of the Chronicles of King David, and then you can see over on the side, there's a lot of, of historical-ish books. The book of Jasher, which we'll look at in a minute, which is actually maybe a musical book. The book of the Acts of Solomon, uh, sometimes just referred to as the Acts of Solomon or the Testimony of Solomon, the Book of the Kings of Israel and Judah, the Book of the Kings of Israel, the Book of the Kings of Judah and Israel, not the Book of First and Second Kings. Separate, separate things. And so you can just continue down that list and you'll see all these different things. There's words from these prophets, various prophets. And then you get into things that are mentioned in the New Testament. Enoch, the Testament or the Assumption of Moses, the Testament of Solomon, and some Greek uh, drama. Uh, when you read through these things, uh, if you're like me, you will find the Greek drama the most interesting. Most of these things just aren't really compelling stories. Except for, I, I like Tobit, and I like Bell and the Dragon, which is in addition to Daniel. Those are really cool stories, but other than that, you're like, when is this going to be over? So, that's kind of what you're dealing with, is all these books. And the question is, why are they referenced, but not retained? How come we don't have them? And so as we start looking at them, some of the books in this list... Oh, it helps to turn the clicker on. Some of the books of the, in the list... Just confirm, in fact, all the books in the list confirm that the Bible is not written in a vacuum. We compared this, when we talked about it very briefly, I think, to the Book of Mormon. How many ancient references is there in the Book of Mormon to literature contemporary to the Nephite people that the Book of Mormon is supposed to be tracing along? How many references are there to contemporary Nephite literature? Zero. How come there's zero? First of all, because I think the Nephites are totally make-believe. But set that aside for a second. How come there's no reference to extra-biblical resources? Because one guy wrote it in a vacuum. In fact, he hid behind a curtain and stuck his face in a hat. And then he dictated the book to his friend, Oliver Cowdery, who judiciously wrote it down. Joseph Smith is an ignorant farmer. And ignorant is not a bad word. What does that mean? He lacks knowledge, right? Not a, not a very, we'll just say, intellectually 
worldly person, right? He, does, he doesn't, just doesn't know a lot of stuff because in a backwoods farm in New York in the early 19th century, you don't run into a lot of ancient Greek literature, right? Farmers typically don't plow the field and discuss, you know, Epimenides. What did you think about that passage? And Epimenides, they just didn't do that, right? And so Joseph Smith doesn't have that kind of knowledge. That's why it's not in the Book of Mormon, because he made all that up. And so there are no references to ancient literature because the author doesn't know them. It's not written in a contemporary time, so there's no references to the things that are going on outside of his little narrative that he tells. And that's what we would expect in the Bible if the Bible were written by some ancient Hebrew hiding behind a, a curtain with his face shoved in a hat. Dean, where are you going? Uh, with most deceptions and lies, you can tell Dean said, okay, everybody here? Okay. That's exactly right. And what you see with these books is a historical context. It lets you know that, okay, this really was written around this time. This really was written when the writer is claiming that it was written, and not years later. Because Joseph Smith claims to have an account written down by somebody who lived a couple thousand years before him but there's no references to external sources of any kind? That's really, really weird. It would be like reading through a newspaper account, and there's no references to anything outside of the journalist's personal experiences. It's not a very good newspaper. And so that's, that's what we're seeing here. In these historical accounts, the Bible contains a lot of history. You see that it's not written in a vacuum. We also have to remember that the fact that the Bible references something, or even quotes something, doesn't mean that what it references or quoted is inspired. The ancient Greek poets that Paul will reference, are they inspired or not? No, they're not. Were they wise people? That's debatable. Right? But yeah, we'll just, we'll just give them benefit of the doubt. Yeah, they're pretty wise guys. They, they had their thumb on the pulse of... Actually, you don't use your thumb, because it has its own pulse. They had their finger on the pulse of their culture. They kind of knew what people, what was going on. They knew what people needed to hear, what people wanted to hear. And so when you have Paul quote one of their poets, who says, all Cretans are lazy gluttons, how do you think most ancient Greek people felt about Cretans? They probably felt like they were lazy gluttons, right? And so when he puts that into his play, that's going to be something that gets laughter from the audience. They're going to go, oh yeah, I know Bob. He's a Cretan. That's totally Bob. And that's why it's there. And so when Paul references that, he's like, look, I'm just telling you what they already know. Titus, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a lot to overcome. It's not saying that that Greek poet is inspired. It's just that people can say things that are true, even if they're not a prophet from God. I say things that are true all the time. I'm not a prophet. And so that's, we have to make sure that, that we understand that, because otherwise this will cause us some trouble. So the fact that something is referenced in the Bible doesn't mean it comes from God. And the fact that something is quoted in the Bible doesn't mean that the original source, or the, the Greek play, is not inspired by God. Now, are Paul's writings... Inspired by God? Yes. Yes. Is God at liberty to take truth from anywhere and tell it to us? Yes. Right? Because God doesn't lie, and so anything that is true, God can reference it. Or anything that will help us, or show us, or teach us, God is at liberty to use those things. When Jesus sat down and told the parable of the sower, was there a literal sower? sitting in front of them, sowing the seeds? Or was he making up a story? He's telling a story. Now, it's a real event, right? People actually do sow seeds. But he's telling you a story to illustrate something. 
And the parable of the unjust judge, did he pull everybody in front of a courtroom and they sit and they watch the unjust judge make decisions? No. He's telling a story that relates to people. And, and so that's kind of what you see also in these things. Is that God, God has the liberty to take truth wherever it exists or to illustrate truth in any way that will help us. He's the teacher. And so he gives us what we need. Some of these books, when you look through that list, if you've got one, some of these books are historical or administrative. If you were a king in the ancient world, chances are you had some chronicles. Why would you want the, somebody to chronicle your time as king? Historical reference. Okay, this one. Danny? To tell the story. To tell whose story? King's story. The king's story, right? And so your chronicler is probably going to make you look good or bad. There's one in the Yes. You'll read through ancient battles, right? And sometimes there'll be a battle, you know, of King, King Mahubahaba drew up in battle array against the evil Wakanites. And King Mahubahaba, with four billion soldiers, smashed the Wakanites, and it was a glorious battle. Did he have four billion soldiers? No, but the chronicler did not want to be dead. So, he makes the king look awesome. And if you are a king, are you a king with no subjects? No. Do most of your subjects follow you out to the battlefield? No. So, you want the subjects to know that you went out to the battlefield and did what? triumphed gloriously. And if you went out to the battlefield and you talked to the other king and you're like, look, my nephew's sick. The crops aren't doing so well. Can we just do this next year? And the other king's like, good, yeah, good. See you next year. And then you go home. What is your chronicler going to write? It was a great victory. The enemy saw our superior forces and declined to initiate combat. And then you go home and you promulgate that to your subjects, right? Because you're not a king without subjects, and you want them to feel subject to you. And so, do you think David did that? <coughs> totally. Yes. David is not above politics. He has to deal with the reality of politics in Judea. In fact, several times, not dealing well with politics almost results in David losing his kingdom. So, like any other ancient king, David is going to have these chronicles that talk about how awesome he is, and do you think God is going to include that in his accurate historical account? We'll just cut that stuff out. So it's not there. That is probably what is in the Chronicles of King David. I don't know. haven't read them. Nobody has. And, and so that's probably what those things are like. When you get to the Chronicles of Ancient Kings, the point of the Chronicle, most of the time of those ancient kings is to tell you how awesome the king is which stands in very stark contrast to 1st and 2nd Chronicles, does it not? What is the primary message of 1st and 2nd Chronicles? These kings are terrible. <laughs> They're awful. Look at all the bad stuff they do. No king wants chronicles like that. And so that the, the facts that we have, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and it talks about all the mistakes that kings make, the fact that we have 1st and 2nd kings, and it talks about all the mistakes that those kings make... Those are probably accurate. Those passed the smell test. But if you're reading an ancient historical document and all it does is talk about how awesome the king was or how awesome the general was, like Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, he never makes mistakes. He's, he's amazing. He is the hero of his own story. And so when you read that, you're like, I believe he was in Gaul. I believe he won. But not like he describes it. And so that's what these ancient documents are like. Most kings have these chronicles. And Solomon probably did, and all these kings did, all these mentions. These are probably the king's own personal records that they would distribute out to make them look as good as they possibly can. So a lot of these books are historical in nature. And it's important for us to know that in all of the books that we have, God's primary purpose is to chronicle detail the redemption of all people, how everybody can be redeemed. In American Sign Language, the Bible is called the Jesus Book. 
It's about Jesus. It's about how God is redeeming all of mankind. Bringing us home. That's what God wants to do. And so there's a lot of historical information that isn't in the book. It's not the purpose of those things. But what we can see throughout these historical books, especially when you get to some of the prophets, uh, these books that the prophets wrote. Look over in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 29. Chapter 9, verse 29. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, from the first to the last, are they not written in the history of Nathan the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahijah the the Shilonite, and in the visions of Iddo the seer concerning uh, Jeroboam the son of Nebat? And Solomon reigned in uh, Jerusalem over all Israel for forty years. We're just going to finish the chapter. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. So you see these books that are written by the prophets. I don't know what is in those books. Nobody does. But is it possible that God gave directions that are nation of Israel specific? Yes. Like maybe telling Israel, hey guys, this coming year, plant oats. (laughs) Do they have oats in the Middle East? I don't pretend they do. Hey guys, plant oats this coming year. Not wheat. It'd be a bad year for wheat. Plant oats. What does that have to do with the, the story of redemption? Not much. Is it possible that God gave Israel some direction that doesn't have to do with redemption? Yes. Do we need to have that recorded for us in order to follow the story of redemption? No, I don't care what they planted. Honestly. They planted it, they they harvested it, they ate it. So God's primary goal in all of these things is the redemption of his people. And what we have preserved for us is the writings that tell us the redemptive story. It traces the lineage of Jesus from Abraham to David to Jesus. It it traces things so that we can make the connections to see the story of Jesus. God worked and cared worked with and cared for Israel in daily life. And and a lot of these things that we don't have may just be that stuff. (laughs) Giving Israel guidance in political decisions. Giving giving Israel guidance in in, in foreign affairs. I don't know what was in those books. Uh, But what we see is that faithfulness comes with eternal and temporal blessings. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most... to be pitied. So there's an eternal hope. But there's also hope in this life. Sometimes, being a believer comes with temporal blessings, too. And we're going to talk about some of those in a little bit. I'm not saying that God is going to make you rich and give you a Ferrari and give you a 4,000 square foot house on the beach in Maui. Right? That's not what we're talking about when we say temporal blessings. But being a faithful follower of God comes with both eternal and temporal blessings. And so we can't ever forget that being a Christian does have benefit in this life. It mostly has benefit in the eternal life. And that's where I would like most of my benefit to be. But we can't forget that God is with Israel, and he works with us today, and he gives us things today, just like he did back then. God isn't gone You listen to some people talk about God, and it's like, yeah, God really cared about Israel. He was involved in their daily life. And then this Christianity thing came along. And then after about 70 AD, he just doesn't really care about your life anymore. Is that true? I don't think so. The fact that you can't speak in tongues or raise people from the dead doesn't mean God doesn't care about your life. It doesn't mean that God is uninvolved in your life. Are you his child? the Spirit come into your heart causing you to cry out, Abba, Father. We have, she's three months old now, and she will sit in the room and she will cry. What do I do when that baby cries? I'll tell you, I will be honest. Karen, the baby's crying! (laughs) Now, 
What do I do when the baby cries? I leave whatever it is I'm doing and I go and I make sure that the baby gets the attention that she needs because the baby is my child and the baby is crying. You are God's child, are you not? Yes. God cares for his children. He cares about you. He cares about what happens to you. And the promise throughout the book is that ultimately he will take care of you and that those who harm you will have to pay. So God cares about you, just like he cared about the ancient Israelites and just like he, he, he guided them and, and gave them what they needed. He gives us the same things. We don't need miraculous things. We don't need to speak in tongues. We don't need to heal people, from, from raise people from the dead. It would be neat if we could. We don't need those things, and so they don't exist anymore. Uh, so that, that's, I think, why some of the historical books are missing. Some of the books are also musical or poetic. And when we talk about poetry, it doesn't mean that they're not useful. It just means that they're different. And the book of Jashar is one of these books probably of poetry. Look over in uh, Joshua chapter 10 and verse 31. I hope that when we're done, normally when, if you see a list of books like this, you're like, oh, history, boring. But no, I hope what, what this will do is I hope this is going to strengthen our faith and show us that throughout time, God has always cared about everybody and God is giving us what we need in order to serve him. And the fact that you might see something mentioned that isn't in your Bible doesn't mean that God forgot to put it in. So you look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 31. What has just happened that is really cool in Joshua chapter 10? <laughs> if the sun's tense still. Wow. <laughs> For how long? For a day. What would have to happen for the sun to stand still? The earth would not only have to stop rotating, what else would it have to stop doing? It would have to stop revolving around the sun. So you have this rotational motion, and you have this... Is that radial motion? Work with me, physics people. What? Yeah, the revolution has to stop, and the orbit around the sun has to stop. Orbital. It's, it has to stop. Otherwise the sun moves. How fast are we moving? How fast is the earth rotating? The circumference of the earth is roughly, we're just going to make math easy, <coughs> roughly 24,000 miles. How long does it take the earth to turn all the way around? 24 hours. So we're spinning at about a thousand miles an hour. You don't really feel the wind speed on that, thankfully. Right? How fast are we orbiting around the sun? Let's assume that our orbit is circular. Makes the math easier. How far away are we from the sun? Yes. 9.8 billion miles. Is it billion? I hope it's billion. Nine, it might be trillion. Does anybody know? What's an astronomical unit? The distance here, the distance yeah, the distance between the sun and the earth. <laughs> I'm going to look this up. I, forgot. I think it's 9.8 billion. Somebody use Siri. Oh, Siri, what is one astronomical unit? It's a lot. 9.8 billion. What's the circumference of a circle? Diameter pi. Right? 2 pi r. I always do diameter pi. Just get the radius out of the way. Right? Diameter pi. That's your circumference of the circle. It's a ratio between the diameter and the, and the roundness of the circle anyway, so I don't know why they stick radius in there. It's so they can trick you on math problems. Diameter pi gives you circ circumference of the circle. So, assuming 9.8, just make it 10 billion miles. 20 billion times pi. Make it 3. 60 billion miles. It takes roughly 300 days to go around the circle. We're making the math easy, right? So what's 60 billion divided by 300? Yeah. Louder? 200 million. It has to be 9.8 million miles. Billion is too big. 
So that would make it 200,000 miles an hour. You're traveling around the un, the un, the sun. <laughs> Math makes me crazy. You're traveling around the sun at 200,000 miles an hour while spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. You're moving super fast. The technical term is booking it. <laughs> you are screaming through space, and all of a sudden, God just stops it. What would happen if the Earth just stopped? You would feel the wind speed on that, right? It would be unbelievable. But it doesn't, none of that happens. And I don't know if these ancient people knew any of that. I don't know how up-to-date Joshua was on his astronomy. But the fact that the sun just stands still when all of those things have to happen, and that's just a rough approximation. Right? And the fact that all that happens, when you're done, would you want to sing a song about that? I would. If you're a songwriter, you've got material for the rest of your life. <laughs> Of course you're going to sing a song, but you're going to write poetry about it. You're going to make plays about it. You're going to do everything. You're going to want to make sure people remember the day the sun stood still. And so at the end of this account, in Joshua chapter 10, it says, uh, Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lebanon to Lachish, and they laid siege to it. And that's not what we want. I hate it when I write down the wrong verse reference. Joshua chapter 10... Oh, why do I do this? Is it verse 12? Yeah, it's verse 13. 31, 13. Okay, in verse 13, the sun and the moon stood still, it stopped, and the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? <coughs> well, what's the book of Jashar got written in it that we don't have in this account? The sun stood still, and Israel took vengeance on their enemies. Well, yeah, they did. Well, when you look over in David's account, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, so turn over there. We're going the long way around to prove that this is a book of songs. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, and verse 17, Saul and David have died. Saul and Jonathan have died. And David is crushed. Sad. David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son, and he said it should be taught to the people of Judah. The it there, you may have a footnote on there. Uh, the bow, that the bow should be taught to all the people of Judah. Can you think of a story that involved David and Jonathan and a bow? Yeah. Is that not a really powerful symbol of his friendship with Jonathan, that story? And so here you have David lamenting his friend, and we don't need the words written down in the book of Jashar because we have them recorded here for us in 2 Samuel. And it's clear that the editors in my version have set this apart in a poetic format, so it's clear to the reader that you're reading a song here, so if we have the words to the song, what additional information might be included in the book of Jashar that we don't have here? The music. The music. The music. So God records the words, but he doesn't record the tune for us. Why do you think that is? Yeah, the words have meaning to us. The music doesn't. Do you think the music was really nice? I think it was horrible. Have you ever heard ancient Hebrew music? I haven't. I'm glad I haven't. Have you seen the instruments they play? It had to be horrible. I imagine it sounded like ancient Chinese music, you know, that whiny, warbly thing, because their instruments are very similar. Or, or ancient Indian music. Have you ever heard anybody play a sitar? Do you want to go jam out to sitar music? The Beatles did, but it was the 60s. Cut, give them a break, right? No. 
And so God doesn't record the music because that music is totally cultural. The words, however, are eternal. The words have teaching. The words have meaning. And so we get the words. And so there might be lots of things. When you're reading through the Psalms, it's clear that there are references to some external books. And these Psalms, are some of them are clearly intended to be set to music. You have Asaph and the players and the harpists and the singers. and all these, But God doesn't record the music for us. Mostly because he knew that around the 21st century we would have way better music. And he doesn't record that because the sounds aren't the important thing. The words are. The words are. And so he records the words. So uh, we're pretty much covered everything on this. Uh, Art, whether you're drawing, painting, playing, singing, art is one of the primary expressions of human creativity. And in a sense... All human creativity is art. You probably pay top dollar for art that you drive. Designers sit and plan, and they 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 are they pay terrible attention to all the details on your car to make it as beautiful as possible. Buildings are designed to be beautiful. Everything, in a way, can be art. Many things can be art. And human creativity is expressed in art. And so we see that God is working for Israel throughout their daily life. He's caring for them. There's these blessings that come regardless of whether or not we have the words recorded. And that the primary story of all of this is that God is with us. And God works with us today. And he helps us to be creative today. And he isn't gone. Alright, so some of the books are just plain weird. We, We have like three minutes left to cover these. Uh, I want to read to you from the book of Enoch, which is quoted in Jude. Behold, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on them and destroy the wicked and reprove the carnal for everything which the sinful and godly have done and committed against the Lord. The Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. That's Jude 14 and 15. Also in this book is lots of poetic language. If you've ever read Genesis chapter 6 and you've heard somebody say, oh, that's angels having children with ladies and they're making giant babies. That comes from the book of Enoch chapter 7. I want to read from you a section uh, of the book of Enoch, which is written uh, between 350 B.C. All right, so it lists all these different angels. There's this huge list of names which I'm not going to read. They took wives, each choosing for themselves who they began to approach, and they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. And the women conceived brought forth, and brought forth giants, whose stature was three hundred cubits. These devoured all which the men labored and produced until it became impossible to feed them. And then they turned against themselves and devoured themselves. They injured birds and beasts and reptiles and fishes and ate themselves and drank their blood. Then the earth reproved the unrighteous. How tall is 300 cubits? Yes. These giants would be 450 feet tall. That's lots of feet. I think somebody made this up. But that that is where the idea that Genesis 6 is about giants the, the uh, angels and women giving birth to giants that comes from the book of Enoch and so it's a very old idea from around 300 BC or so but in the original story they're 450 feet tall and they're cannibalistic uh, so that, that's kind of it's a weird book the book of Enoch <coughs> the assumption of Moses is, is also weird uh, I wanted to read a little bit of it uh, but we're about to be out of time basically Moses is about to die and he recites some things to Joshua And it sounds almost like the book of Revelation. So all the pictures, the moon going dark, and the the, 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 sun going dark, and the moon turning to blood, and the oceans boiling, and all of those things, those are in the Assumption of Moses. It's a really apocalyptic book. Which, what do you think people do with those crazy signs? They They do the same thing they do with the book of Revelation. They make stuff up. And if you don't know the foundational texts, which are the Old Testament prophets, then it's easy to make stuff up. But the assumption of Moses is founded in the prophets, just like the book of Enoch is. They're extra writings that people have written, and they help to explain spiritual things. It gives us insight into what the people back then thought, 
But there is a big difference between the Bible and these extra books. Huge difference. Uh, when you read through them, it's very easy to see. It's just not the same. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention and your comments.